Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for just who you are. Uh, Lord, it is amazing uh, what a privilege it is to have a have fellowship with you, to, to begin to be able to see you in all the beauty and all the splendor of the world and in our working in our lives in ways, Lord, that sadly so many people just miss. And uh, so we thank you that uh, you drew us to you through your spirit and that you put people in our lives who were bold enough to share the gospel with us and that you opened our ears to hear it, Lord. And, and we just ask for your spirit this morning to help us understand your word, to help us to see your glory in the truths of your word. And then as we leave this room and, and go to the other room, Lord, that you would just be with us as we worship, Lord. Take our imperfect prayers, our imperfect songs, our imperfect giving, and, and transform it to something acceptable and pleasing in your sight because we are in Christ. We just thank you so much and ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us and was raised again. Amen. Okay. <laughs> So, here we go. <clears throat> Over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at types of passages that are used to support the doctrine of limited atonement. And uh, uh, now the people who disagree with that view will point to several other passages and say, well, we need to understand those in light of these more general, unlimited kind of passages um, and so today we're going to start to look at those passages that are most frequently used to argue for the unlimited view. And, um, you know, the one thing I want to just add before we move on that to doing that, though, is that the Bible doesn't contradict itself. So um, when people say there are texts on both sides, there really aren't texts on both sides. The, the question is... Uh, are there texts that reasonable people would read and come to a conclusion different, uh, different conclusions? And of course that's the case, right? I mean, so both sides have to reckon with the fact that there are, there are passages that seem to say things that would create difficulties for their understanding of how all of this works. So A, we are dealing with God and how he works so it's not like we should expect this to be like super easy <laughs> but but the second thing is like we really need to think about what explanation accounts for the the, the best understanding of all of the information um, all of those texts and these these verses aren't supposed to be like used like hand grenades you know <laughs> where you're just and, and so I really just want us, we want to submit to the authority of the word, do our best to understand it. I I'm obviously have, have a position, as, as does everybody else who's going to talk about this or teach on it. Um, uh, I believe that position best accounts for all of the information. However, there are some passages that so, come up so frequently in uh, support of what people think is the other side of the issue uh, that and there's so many people who who uh, have that other view that I think we have to be very careful about making it seem like somebody who disagrees is just unbiblical, unspiritual, not very smart, or whatever. Um, because clearly that is not the case. Now I think they're wrong, but I <laughs> I can still I can still say that without without. Uh, being unloving or, uh, you know, we should be humble about this. We're, we're all seeking to understand God's word. So, you know, that's just, it's important to me because I think um, so often the argument gets abstracted from our relationship to Christ and our relationship to one another. And that's foolish, foolishness. Um, and in fact, I wanted to also point something out Um and actually, Joni sort of alluded to this. I don't know whether intentionally or not, but she did. Um, that 
even within what's considered the Reformed tradition, there are different views of the atonement um, and how this how this works. Um, there are views that could be called, you know, there are people who would say they hold to a limited view, but really when you look at what they're saying, it's functionally unlimited. There are people who, within the Reformed community, who um, do, not, um, do not accept limited atonement in the way that I'm teaching it. Um, so even, and this, is a, and this is an important point, because I actually had a conversation with somebody at this church who, who had a question about this several months ago, that even at the uh, Synod of Dort, which we haven't covered the history of it, the Synod of Dort is, is the, the, the uh, gathering of the church within the Reformed community to rule on whether Arminius' teachings this, are, were Reformed or not. And uh, they said no. But even within that synod, there were people who did not subscribe to limited atonement in the way that we're talking about it. And then at the Westminster Convention, when, when the Westminster Standards were put together, and, and the West, for if you don't know, the Westminster Confession is probably the, well, I, mean, I don't even think there's a probably about it. The Westminster Confession is the most uh, authoritative, influential English um, confession that captures this view. Um, in fact, a lot of other confessions are really just tweaks to that. The, the Second London Baptist Confession, we, anyway, we're not doing history today. Point is, like if you want to know what, a English, what did English Calvinists teach, that's where you go. And um, there were people involved in those deliberations who had, who had some questions about the way this was being articulated. So I, I just want to say we need to be humble, we need to be cautious, and we need to um, you know, recognize that because those, those men were not, they didn't accept the Arminian position. When most people are talking about this, those are the two views they're going to contrast. There are other views, and uh, we'll talk about that briefly because um, it, it will bear upon what kind of under, how, when you say, well, how would a reformed person understand these universal texts? Um, the answer is in, in a couple of places. It depends on what kind of reformed person you, you are talking to. And I don't want to confuse anybody. It's been, uh, I've tried to keep this pretty, you know, fairly basic level so far, but there are a couple nuances that I want to make sure you understand. Um, so, uh, Within Protestantism, which is obviously larger than just the reform movement, there are obviously a lot of people who reject limited atonement. But even people who even people who would um, accept, you know, election and predestination, even within that group of broader Protestants, which used to be all of them, but now certainly not, um, there are there are some slightly different uh, understandings. So, Martin Luther, for example, didn't didn't accept limited atonement. Luther, <clears throat> Luther's approach to that, though, and, and you know, I don't, don't agree with him, but um, his approach was, look, we just don't need to reconcile this stuff. It doesn't, it's just not something we even need to really work on and worry about. So it didn't bother Luther that, that these, these things, that this tension was there. Uh, and it probably didn't because of the way he understood the, the, the pronouncement of grace within the sacraments and everything. I mean, it made sense for his his view to just say, you know, we don't need to, we don't really need to delve into that or try to connect all the dots here. But anyway, I'm spending more time on this than what I, what I wanted to just point out, though, is that we need to have some grace and humility. I think um, there are some problems with those other views, but um, they are there. I want to acknowledge that. So, um you can deny limited atonement, not necessarily agree with the Arminian stuff that you're going to see if you look it up on the on the web or whatever. So um, can't address all of those. But I do want to, you know, I guess, I guess, I guess it would be appropriate to give you a little more framework about what I'm saying. Uh, so within the historic historical reformed views of, and this is really this really has more to do with election. But it bears on how some of these texts are understood. So if you guys are, are willing to go one a little one step more advanced, I can, yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So <clears throat> one view is called supralapsarianism, which the, the Latin word supra means above or before, right? So it means that the decree of God to elect comes above the decree of the fall. I wish I had my whiteboard. <laughs> I didn't carry it in this morning. But uh, so <clears throat> if you think about within the supralapsarian view, so lapse meaning like a lapse of judgment, lapse refers to the fall. Supralapsarian, above the fall. So in the order of decrees, election comes above the fall. So if you think about that view, if you want to write this down, you can, or I'll probably put together a chart <coughs> for you in the future notes. But they understand this to work like the first decree was God's election. The first decree related to the plan of redemption was God's election. Now that requires then a double predestination. He chooses to save some and chooses to damn others. That's the first decree. The second decree would be to create. So that that decree occurred prior to creation, or prior to the decree to create. The next decree was the fall. So the election occurs before creation and before fall. The next decree is to provide for the salvation of the elect, and then the, the, the next decree is to call the elect to salvation. So if you think about that as like a five-step process, God's decree is to elect, then to create, then he decrees to fall, then he decrees to provide salvation for those for, for the elect, and then fifth is to call the elect and apply that salvation. Uh, that's supralapsarianism. And a lot of people, you know, that's the way a lot of people understand it. <clears throat> uh, the, the next uh, really common view is something called infralapsarianism. And the word infra is a Latin word that means uh, below. And it just means that the, the decree for the, for the uh, election comes after the fall, infralapsarian, below the fall in terms of order of decrees. So infralapsarianism understands the decree to work this way. God decreed to create. Then he decreed the fall. Then he decrees to elect some unto salvation. Then he de uh, decrees to provide that. Then he decrees to call those who would, um, who were elected. So in the infralapsarian view, God is electing to save people out of a group that was all fallen. Right? Because the decree to the fall is a sort of a universal decree. Then he elects to save some. That's my view. I think that's the best... Uh, most consistent view I can come up with to understand the scriptural teaching because when we see uh, God talking about his election and his calling it appear, it seems to me he's always talking about electing to life from death so um, you don't have the you don't have this um, this harsh double pre there's still sort of two, two sides to it but it's not this it's not that God is making this choice prior to the fall, but he's electing to save some out of which who, who are fallen. <clears throat> so those are the two sort of most common reformed views. Uh, then there is, there's, a, there's another view, and this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, there's another set of views that are acceptable. They're kind of frowned upon, but they're acceptable. You know, you're, they're not going to kick you out. Of sort of reform circles um, and uh, those views are hypothetical universalist views or sometimes they're called Amy Raldism. Now there are some technical distinctions between some of these between those two but but they function the same way in terms of what I'm what I'm talking about right now. So they, the, the, in those cases the, the, the first decree is to create, the second decree is the fall, the third degree is to provide salvation sufficient for everybody. The fourth is to elect some and pass over some. And then the fifth is to call, is for that gospel, the gospel presentation, the response, and all that. 
So in the case of, of that, that, the atonement applies to everybody in the same way, but election does not. In the former two views I talked about, the, the work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all perfectly in alignment toward the same groups of people. In this view, Jesus atones for everybody, but God doesn't elect everybody to salvation. Uh, and then you have the Ar Armenian view, which is that God decrees the creation, God decrees the fall, God provides salvation for everybody in the atonement. The atonement is actually, you know, accomplishing something for everybody. Um, and then the, the call, he calls all and then elects those who believe or who he foresees will believe. So those are, those are slight differences, but they make, they make a big difference in terms of how you're going to understand some of the, some of the, the various texts. One other point uh, that a lot of people get tripped up on this when you're talking about, you know, <laughs> creation and the, then the fall, that this is not in time. We're talking about logical priority of decrees, not this happens first, this happens second, this happens third. In classical theology, I believe, you know, if, as we're reading the Bible, you don't see a progression of thoughts in God's mind. God doesn't learn something and then make it that he doesn't like create and go, oh, and then do something else because he's omniscient. All this, what we're talking about is just a logical order. So um, I guess I'll pause there. That's a lot of, I wish, I wish I had my whiteboard today, uh -huh. but does it make sense? <laughs> the key, the key difference is in the super view the, the election occurs prior to creation or the fall. God decrees that some will be saved to his glory and some will be damned to his glory prior to creation, prior to fall. The infralapsarian view, which is the view that I hold, and uh, uh, that view is that God decrees to create, then he decrees the fall, then he decrees to elect some to salvation for his glory. Okay. The Salmeraldian view, um, probably like the most, the, the next view, if I wanted to give you like a contemporary person, it would be somebody like Bruce Ware, mm -hmm. or until about a year ago, Josh Tancordo. Mm -hmm. so, so he's continuing to study this and he's moved away from that. So uh, after Infralapsarian and between that and Arminian, what was that called, that, that view? Uni uh, hypothetical universalism these guys don't get tenure if they don't use like you know big words all it means is that really the essence of that view is that jesus it it, it, it doesn't accept a limited atonement but then uh the father does not elect um everyone that was atoned for and in the Arminian view, the father's election is based usually on his foreknowledge mm -hmm. of what people will do. In that view, it is not. It's just, it's a sovereign decree, but he doesn't decree to elect all who Christ atoned for. I, I think there are some problems with it. Anyway, this is a, that would take us into a little different direction. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I figured. Um, are we good? Any questions? I'm happy to answer any questions you have on that. I might give you like some supplemental notes that fleshes that out a little bit. It's it's not. Well, let's just move on. John, well, it's important, but uh, so John 17, 21 through 23. So now we're going to look at some texts that are used to support a universal view of atonement or an unlimited view of atonement. John 17, 21 through 23. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. Why would, why would this be a passage that might support a universal understanding of the atonement? This one comes up a lot. Anybody have any ideas? 
idea. Is that the world may believe you sent me? Yeah, what was that again, Sandy? Uh, the phrase, so that the world may believe that you sent me, the word world. That's right. So, so the idea, or their understanding of that is, look, this prayer occurs as Jesus is getting ready to go do this work. He's getting ready to go to the cross. This is his high priestly prayer where he's interceding. Um, he's making intercession. And, and what does he say, right? The, that so that the world may believe. So his intention is that this unity for which he's praying will occur so that the world may believe. And they understand that to be a, a, a universal uh, reference there. And then it occurs twice, actually, it, you know, mm -hmm. so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even, even as you have loved me. Okay. So that's, that's the, their, their position there, that well, it couldn't be more clear. That's his desire. So um, what's interesting is when we went through the passages that are used to support limited atonement, one, one of those passages include these verses, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So how, here we have an example, and that's why I started with this one. We have the same passages that are just being looked at in, very, in a very different light. So what, would somebody, so what would somebody on the limited side uh, say about this? W what is going on here in this passage? Well, I think you need to back up to verse 20. Okay, so what is verse I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. It's, if you identify that as the they mm -hmm. rather than the world. Yeah. They is how he who he identified as the first subject in the paragraph. Right. So um, you have you have here uh, an argument about what what the what the implication of the prevailing context is on this. So even if you go back further, um, it, let's just look at the beginning of this. When Jesus is the beginning of the chapter, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, "The Father, uh, Father, the hours come." Glorify your son that your son may glorify you since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom, whom you have given him. So again, those who hold the limited view, we would say, look, he is making intercession now. And one of the things he's saying is that he, he's about to be glorified. He's, he's going to be able to provide this eternal life to those whom the father has given him. So, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ from whom you've had sent. So how, how does this get applied? How is this eternal life applied? Through the knowledge of Christ, right? They know the Father through the Son. They know them both, right? I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Boy, that's a profound verse. Yeah. I, we should do a whole class on that. But um, so then what does he say? I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. So he's, he's talking here about who? He's talking about the apostles, right? He's talking about the, the people whom he shared his name with. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now... They know that everything that you have given me is from you. So he's talking about his key disciples. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and I have come to know in truth that I come from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So he's setting this whole thing up. And then he's going, he tells us in verse 9, he's making intercession first for them. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. So you can see already, we've seen a couple times that there are those the Father's given him, and he has some, he's interceding for them. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. So he's getting ready to, to die and be raised and ascend. Holy Father, keep them. So who are they? The disciples. These disciples, in your name, which you have given to me 
Now, here's a really important concept that he introduces, a profound concept, something that I really wish would be preached on much more because it's all through the New Testament, and that has to do with the believer's union with Christ. It's, it's a huge, hugely important thing. I think a lot of misunderstandings come from not getting this, but he says here, um, uh, you have give, th that uh, keep them in your name which you have given to me that they may be one, even as we are one. That's a profound statement. The, the, these, these believers, these apostles, these disciples, he's praying, he's interceding to God that they would be one in fellowship, the way the Son and the Father are in fellowship. That is amazing. While I was with them, I kept them in your name which you gave me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the Son of Destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Who's he talking about? Judas. Judas. So Judas has been lost, but that was fulfilled, you know, that was so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So now, We've already seen at least three different ways he's using the term world. He's using the term world here in contrast to um, these folks. They're not of the world. They're not from the world. In fact, they're united together in, the, in, in this fellowship in Christ. I do not, now listen, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil ones. So he's interceding for them. For their protection, for their comfort, um, and this this is a this is such a comforting thing to think about as a Christian, like knowing that you know the Lord is the one that intercedes for us. But they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Set them aside. Make them like Christ. Make them pure vessels. Right. That's what sanctify means. Through the word. As you've sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. Okay, we're still so he's still talking about these these disciples that are going to do this work. He's he's got some work for them to do. He's sending them into the world. He's not asking they be taken out of the world. He's asking for their protection. And here's another mind blowing thing. I love this chapter, by the way, because there's so mm -hmm. much depth here. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified. In truth. So again, there's content to the faith. This is the gospel. This is so they're going to be set aside in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So you have this group of uh, people that Christ's interceding for who he's saying they're not of the world, they're no longer in the world, but he wants them to stay in the world, right? And he's also interceding for all those who will believe through their through their proclamation of this truth that sanctifies. And why does he say that? And this is this whole union thing again. <clears throat> I do not ask for these only. For I don't just ask for the apostles, but for all those who will believe in me through their word, which is the scripture, basically, and they're verbal and then written. We have it written. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, so that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So now again, we have this, this, this contrast that's been made all the way through this. Um, and we're, we're seeing this play out. So these are those the Father gave. He doesn't lose any of them. He calls them out of the world, and he wants them to be in unity, so that this, so it's an evidence that it is it's, it, that God, that Jesus is who He says He is, and that God is the one working here. <clears throat> the glory that You have given me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So again, this is like <laughs> this concept of union can't be disconnected from what He's interceding for. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. 
Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So here's the, here's the, here's the, the idea. Uh, from a limited view, what he is asking here is that he, he does want people who aren't believers at the moment he's praying this prayer to be believers. And one of the, one of the things that will attract those to them is this love, this unity. It's an evidence that, the, that God is at work here. So really, I mean, he, he's, he's saying that there are people who have not yet come to Christ, but that the Father has given to Christ, and Christ is doing this work on their behalf, and they will come. So when he's talking about the world, all through this passage, he's, he's, he's making it clear that he's interceding for those whom the Father has given to him. And what he's accomplishing for them is union with Christ. They will be united. And at the very beginning, he talks about the what is the evidence of that? It's faith. It's the knowledge that Jesus is who he said he was and that the Father is who he said he was. So when you look at a, a verse like this and they say, well, look, he's, he's arguing that this be done so that the whole world may believe. Yeah, the call is genuine. Everybody should believe. Everyone should see this and respond. Again, I'm, I'm an infralapsarian. I'm saying, look, God's desire is for the church to give evidence that what who Christ said he was is true. But who's going to come? Who's going to be united? There's this distinction that runs all the way through this thing. It's those the Father has given to him. And so we go out into all the world and we preach the gospel. And what is our desire when we do that? They come. That they come and be united to Christ. But as he's interceding, he's making it clear he's doing this for those whom the Father has given him. So again, you if you extract, the, the, the word world is being used in different ways throughout this passage. And um, you can't just pull a verse out and use it without reference to the rest of the context. So we can argue about which one is understanding the verse correctly, but there are multiple emphases in this context that show he's, he's interceding for those whom the Father has given him. Now that message goes into all the world, and all the world should believe, but they, they don't. And that's a, you know, he doesn't address why here, but we've seen that in other other passages. So you got to look at, we would argue, the context of this prayer uh, establishes that. And you've got to look at that, that tension between the world and who he's talking about all through that prayer. It, well, it's my opinion, but it's clear to me that he's originally addressing his current followers of the day when he was on earth speaking this. He was talking about his followers. But there's a pivot where he says, and those who will believe through their word. So he's expanding it into the future, but it's specifically targeted for future believers who are believing the word that comes to them through this passed down of the gospel to the believer. Right. So to try to try to simplify the analysis here, you're, we're going to see a lot of places where the world and all, all people are mentioned. And... Anyone who responds to the gospel will be saved, right? That's not the issue. The issue here is who is Christ interceding for and why? And so he's interceding first for his apostles and next for those who will believe through their word so that the world will know. Now, interestingly, Paul later will use um, the, um, the the gospel is, is a word of life to those who will believe and it's a... Uh, word of judgment on those who won't so you know what i mean it's not as though this this evidence is going isn't ever going to be brought in to court um i had a conversation with somebody just about a month or two ago and they said you know what what evidence is there you know for for all the, for christianity be, being true and you know i started to talk about all of the sort of normal evidences that you would because it's i think pretty pretty overwhelming and they said, no, 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 no. I mean, but that was all years ago. Like, and I said, listen, 
all you need to do, all you need to do to really see the reality, reality of it is ask yourself, you know, are lives being changed? I, I've known probably at this point in my life hundreds of people who their marriages have been restored. They've been freed from addictions. They've been freed from all sorts of just horrible, ugly stuff. You know, I've never seen a self-help person have that kind of effect, right? It's real. It's it, the church and the love within the church. And there's a lot of bad stuff in churches. I'm not denying that. But that's not surprising either that the enemy is going to want to infiltrate and attack that. But you find people who legitimately love the Lord and you ask them what impact that's had on, your, on their life. And I guarantee you, you're not going to find anybody who goes in. Eh, it just it just doesn't happen, and so we just don't want to talk about like we don't want to talk about that. So you, they they want to look at statistics. You know, people will look at all kinds of statistics about you know divorce and all kinds of things, and it's like you but you got to be careful with that. You have to go. Okay, yeah, sure. There's a lot of people who go to church who don't have any evidence of you know, saving faith. I'm talking about people who are in the word, who are in prayer, who are in fellowship consistently. When you talk to them, their relationship with Christ is a real relationship. You ask those people whether or not, you know, how their lives are now compared to before they knew him. And it's, it's, it's dramatic. So I, I always find it funny that everyone says, oh, there's no, like all you need to do was just watch the news. Just watch the news and then go talk to some real Christians and see. I mean, it's just, anyway. But, so I think what he's talking about here is the, those who will be called out of the world because of, uh, because of the ministry of these apostles. And um, that evidence is also plain to those who don't come. Any other questions on that one? Yes. So would an Arminian point to verse 20 as evidence of also those who will believe in him that they yes but we could rebound to back at the beginning to give eternal life to all whom you have given me you could but I wouldn't I don't even think that's necessary okay. if somebody said if somebody was an Arminian and said doesn't verse 20 say not just for these, mm -hmm. this is how they would say it, not right. just for the elect, but for anyone who will believe. And I go, absolutely right, that's right. Mm -hmm. So the question is, who will believe? Mm -hmm. it, it's not, it's, I think a lot of times we get, it's, we want to think of the elect as this sort of like concept and we want to defend it and there's just no, re look, who are the elect? Those who will believe. So if, 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 if somebody says, well, doesn't this say that this is for everyone who believes? You say, yes, absolutely. And that's why the preaching of the gospel is so urgent, so that people can hear and respond. And that's Paul's argument in Romans. How will they hear if there's no one to preach to them? We have to use those means. But the question really is, is the word just necessary? Is the preaching of the word just necessary? Or is the call just necessary or is it necessary and sufficient? So is the death of Christ, the atonement of Christ, necessary to save people? Everybody would agree with that. You can't be saved without it. The question is, is it necessary and sufficient? If Christ died for me, if he completed that work, then I know that nobody can make an accusation against it. Nobody can point to my life or, or any shortcomings, any sin in my life and say, on that basis, you don't, you don't get this. And it's a certainty. Now, um, you know, everybody will talk about things that way, but what we mean when we say that is that it was done. Like my perseverance, my faith, the people who will come in my life to correct me, all of that. You know, Jesus was, was dying for that. And if somebody were to believe, then all of that is theirs. But really the argument isn't about that. The question is, given the fact that everybody's totally depraved and their hearts are hardened and we've all rejected God, why does this person come and that person doesn't? The question isn't once they come, 
Well, of course, once they come, then, then all of these promises are for them. The question is, why, do, why does anybody come? That's really the question. So I, I, you could do that, Janet, but I don't even think it's necessary. I'd just agree with them. Yeah, okay. you're right. That's what I'd say. Okay. So Acts 10, 34 and 35. This is a common one that comes up. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. How would, why would that be um, a compelling verse for someone who's holding an unlimited view, perhaps? Anyone? Well, face value, out of context, you would just think it just says anyone who fears him. Right. So, d is there an issue with that? The I mean, context is that the Jew going to the Gentile and opening salvation to the Gentiles that's right. I think um, <clears throat> two. No, I think that two. Yeah. You touched on two things that I think are the relevant points. One, because we live in a culture so far removed from this Jew-Gentile distinction that we don't we don't think about it. It's not a paradigm through which we think yeah. about God's work. But it really was a big deal in the New Testament, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of the New Testament is spent on what that means for Gentiles and the relationships with God's relationships with the Jews and so forth. So the context here in, in Acts chapter 10 is Cornelius, the first mm -hmm. Gentile convert under the preaching of the gospel. And so what is being asserted here? He, it, the, the question wasn't uh, one of you know, can anybody be saved? It was the, the, the idea that a Gentile could be saved at all without becoming a Jew mm -hmm. was radical. Mm -hmm. And so here what we have is Cornelius being, being saved. He has the evidences of salvation, because evidence of the work of the Spirit in his heart. Um, he's demonstrating, you know, gifts here um, and a confession of faith without conforming to the law. So the question is, is he, is he saved under this gospel preaching or, you know, is it, it, does he have to become a proselyte under, under the law? That's the context, mm -hmm. right? So Peter says, opening his mouth, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does right, right is welcome to him. So when he says does not show partiality, what is he talking about? Partiality to who? Jews. The, the Jews. Jews. And remember, this was a tough thing for him. Yes. God had to, you remember he had this dream with the sheet and the meat. and the, I mean, it wasn't like, it didn't come naturally from what he had learned and the way he had been raised. And so the issue here isn't, um, there's level one, high level. The issue isn't God's work in all nations. The issue is, can somebody who's not a Jew receive this blessing? And he says, God doesn't show partiality. But in every nation, so there's no national limitations to this, right? People of every tribe and tongue and nation can come. The man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Well, what would we say about the man who fears him and does what is right? What is that? That's another way to say faith, isn't it? Comes to him and believes. Is it, it, it right? Who believes, right? To fear God and to do what is right. That is to recognize who God is and to respond through um, our, our um, obedience to him. That's something that comes with faith, right? Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> the issue here is, does this verse mean that anybody in any nation could be saved? Yeah, it does. That's not an issue for 
people who hold a limited view. This verse doesn't say anything about why some people come and some people don't. So it really doesn't, it's really not relevant to the question. Now it's unfortunate maybe that some people speak in a way that makes it sound like uh, <laughs> some people can't, you know, some people are excluded, other people aren't, but that's not, that's not uh, any view I've, I've heard from any, and I've read people who, you know, there's hyper-Calvinists, but that's not what we're teaching. So the issue here is, can anybody from any nation come? Yes, they can. And if they come, should they be accepted in fellowship? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this, this verse really isn't an issue. I don't think it establishes what, I don't think it establishes a particular perspective on limited atonement. Does anybody disagree? I'm happy to. Well, it also doesn't preach salvation by works. No, it doesn't. And again, if you looked at it, you know, out of context, all by itself, and does what is right. See, right there, it says you have to do what is right to be saved. Right. I mean, well, right. You can make so, but yeah, so but what's can, wonderful about this gotta get the is you see salvation by faith resulting in works, which is exactly yeah. what we would we yeah. think the Bible teaches. Right. We don't disconnect the works. And we can, and that's developed as you go through further in right. us. Right. All right. Romans eleven thirty two. Okay, we'll go to Romans eleven thirty two. For God has shut up in disobedience. I'm sorry. So God has shut up all in disobedience, so that He may show mercy to all. Okay, so the idea here is, is what? Why, why, why is this often used um, to support? And, uh, and similarly, the, the, they will get stronger as we go. <laughs> so. so you talk to people about this, say, look, all, all people are under condemnation. All people are in disobedience to the law. That's this entire set. So that through the, through grace through the gospel we may show mercy to all the same thing everybody right that's that would be the way that that's sometimes used oh, we've got some of the same thing going on here the force of the argument is the all being Gentiles that's right this Not whole just Jews. This whole chapter, well, this whole section of Romans, but especially this chapter, is talking about what Paul's addressing is, was God unfaithful to the Jews? What about his covenant with the Jews? And so when we get to chapter 11, he's talking about Israel and God's relationship with Israel. So you have, uh, it begins by him talking about this remnant in Israel so it starts, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite. And he's going to talk about the privileges, and he's going to talk about the fact that there's this remnant of, of faithful Jews, and that those are the true, that's true Israel. Um, and so he, he talks about David. Then in verse 11, he talks about the Gentiles being grafted in which I think is a, also a concept that really probably could use some more attention. You know, we, we become partakers in the promises to Israel through faith. Um, but he's talking about that. You know, we shouldn't be arrogant or boast against the branches. And by the way, one of the titles of Israel in the Old Testament was the elect of God, right? So he's saying, look, through, this has always been through faith, and it's going to, uh, it, it's going to continue to be, through grace rather than faith. So what is the what is the is, the issue here? And then one of the questions then comes up. Well, what about these? What about this this promise to Israel? Uh, there are these other promises to Israel. Are those going to be fulfilled? And what does he say um, right here in verse twenty? As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. 
For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience so that he have, may have mercy on all. He's not even talking about individuals here. He's talking about this Jew and Gentile category. So because the Jews rejected the Messiah, what happens? Where, where does the gospel go? To the Gentiles. So because of Israel's disobedience, grace is shown to the Gentiles. And then what does he say, though? These, these promises to them are irrevocable. So you have this remnant, um, and what's going to happen? The family of God is expanded now. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's gone out, and, and some argue, and I, I think there's something to this, that there will be a, uh, probably a, a, um, a great revival mm -hmm. in Israel. But um, the point is that the Gentiles were sort of, by definition, the disobedient peoples. Right? They didn't have the law. They didn't follow the law. Um, in fact, Jews couldn't even go into the home of a Gentile. Mm -hmm. It would defile them. But now look what's happened. The, the, the Jews became disobedient, and then the gospel goes to these Gentiles. And so both groups, Jews and Gentiles, were disobedient, and God is orchestrating this so that he may bring mercy to both. So that's, that's what's happening here in, in Romans 11. Um, at least that is the way we'd understand it. And I, I should point out, you know, we're giving very high-level analysis of these texts. You can, you can spend years digging down into exegetical details. You're going to come to the, the two sides will come to the conclusions I'm summarizing for you. So I'm trying not to go through it in agonizing levels of detail. But um, the general idea here is uh, when you look at all, the word all here, all means uh, both groups. Jews and Gentiles. It doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't mean every single individual person. Any questions or comments on that? Like I said, we can get into more depth on the, any of these if you, if you want to. I want to be fair. So they're looking at this and saying this is a pattern which we see throughout uh, the scripture having to do with God's intention to show mercy to all and uh, those of us who hold the limited view say, well, contextually, you, you've got to limit this all here to the two groups he's talking about. Now, you know, you might be feeling pretty confident right now if you're holding the limited view, but they get stronger as we go. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what's coming. Um, any last thoughts, questions, comments? We're good? All set. All right. No, I was just going to say that the, the Gentile, I think it was in Romans, but Paul says it's the Gentile, it's only the gospel is open to the Gentiles for only so long because Israel has the veil, and then the words, when the time of the Gentiles is up, then Israel. Yeah, you, yeah, you so see that. The, that's open, that mercy is open to the Gentiles for only so long. And mm -hmm. God's, you know. Yeah, I didn't want to get too much in that because that yeah. raises all kinds of yeah. other issues, but. From, from the perspective of using this verse to teach an unlimited atonement, I think it's unconvincing. Yeah. All right. God bless. Have a good week.